But I started uh, keeping bees about five years ago, and, and I've progressed from being a hobbyist to advising the ATI Student Bee Club to even uh, conducting some research on honeybees. Uh, in fact, I'm currently working with Dr. Reed Johnson, who leads a group of entomology students studying pollinators at the uh, Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center. They're also on the same campus here in Worcester, Ohio as uh, ATI. Being a chemist, I naturally approach my study of, of honeybees from a chemical perspective. In the past, I've given presentations in which I considered both honey and, and propolis from a chemical perspective. This web webinar is a continuation of this series. In the study of honeybees, it's often helpful to consider the beehive as the basic unit of the organism, given how all of the individual bees work in a coordinated fashion for the success of the hive. How honeybees accomplish this is truly a natural wonder, and it all comes down to a complex communication system made up of chemicals called pheromones. Well, what are honeybee pheromones? Honeybee pheromones are pure chemical substances or mixtures of substances released by individual honeybees. These pheromones cause physiological or behavioral changes in other, in other uh, bees. The chemical structures of the compounds comprising these pheromones are not particularly complex as organic chemical compounds go. Yet they accomplish the coordination and control of honeybee development and actions that allow the colony to not only survive, but to even thrive. Pheromonal communication is uh, common in nature, but honeybees exhibit one of the most complex systems we know. Queens, workers, and drones all produce pheromones and 15 pheromone producing glands have been identified in honeybees. These chemicals are both volatile and non-volatile. Now to understand the difference between volatile and non-volatile, volatile, consider that humans can smell volatile compounds very well. That's because uh, volatile compounds evaporate readily and are carried to our noses as vapor mixed with air. Now, of course, honeybees don't have noses to smell with, but their antenna are used to sense volatile pheromones. Non-volatile pheromones are not transmitted as vapor very well, but bees sense them by direct contact with their antenna and other body parts. <coughs> Pardon me. Given the importance of antenna, or given the importance antenna play in receiving chemical messages, we should take a closer look. Honeybees do not have noses like humans. Their olfactory organ is their antenna. While their olfactory acuity is similar to that of humans, worker, uh, worker bees are more sensitive to odors from wax, flowers, nectar, and, and plant resins. Honeybee antenna have several types of sensory structures, including pits, plates, and hairs. Only pore plates, and there are over 3,000 of them on each antenna, are the, are the known part of any olfactory response based on electrophysiological and behavioral odor response. Um, paired antenna, like honeybees have, can even detect the direction from which odors emanate. Uh, Von Frisch did an experiment that, that showed this. Um, he trained worker bees to uh, travel down a tube to a Y uh, intersection, and he would put uh, uh, food on in one of the uh, ends of the tube, either to the left or the right, and he would also put natural flower odors uh, with the food. When the bees reached the fork in the tube, they chose the correct turn to reach the food. However, when their antenna were cross-glued, they would invariably choose the wrong turn at the fork to reach the food. And uh, amputation of the antenna led to a complete loss of olfactory discrimination. So you can see from the picture, there's three main parts to the antenna. So this is uh, on, on the bee's head. Uh, there's the scape, the pedicel, and the, the longest part off to the right is the flagellum. And this, uh, the, the right side, of course, this would be the left antenna. 
Back to pheromones. We can categorize um, pheromones into two broad categories. And uh, uh, they're based on the effect they have. Releaser pheromones elicit behavioral responses from bees and are relatively short acting. The other type are called primer pheromones, and they have long-term physiological effects. Occasionally, a pheromone can fit both categories. We'll see many examples of releaser and primer pheromones as we explore more specifically categorized honeybee uh, uh, pheromones. Before we consider the pheromones in detail, Let's consider some basic principles of structure as it relates to organic compounds. And, and when I say organic compounds, uh, what, I'm, what I mean by that is carbon-containing compounds. The simplest organic compounds, called hydrocarbons, are, as the name uh, implies, made of only carbon and hydrogen atoms. Uh, so that's what's depicted on this slide. These are all um, hydrocarbons. In fact, these are a subclass of hydrocarbons where the carbon atoms are single bonded to each other, and these are called alkanes. When they're part of a bigger molecule, they're referred to as the alkyl group on that bigger molecule. Sometimes the letter R is used to indicate a generic alkyl group in a structure. We can depict alkanes showing each individual carbon and hydrogen atom. Uh, the pictures in the middle are, are examples of that. Um, but those are small molecules. And when we start drawing things that are going to have to be quite a bit bigger, uh, a quicker way to draw them is to use only line segments. Now, the line segments indicate the single bonds between carbon atoms. The end of each line segment is understood to be a carbon atom. And since all carbons in an alkane have a total of four bonds to them, four atoms have to be bonded to each carbon, any missing bond to carbon are assumed to be hydrogen atoms. So this type of drawing highlights the carbon skeleton of an organic molecule. So the four structures I have on the, the slide, two of them are complete expanded structures. Uh, there's butane at the top and isobutane at the bottom. On the right of those are the skeletal structures. that are just showing the carbon skeleton. So there's two reasons they're drawn in that zigzag fashion. One is so that you can actually see the end of a line segment. The lines don't run together into one long line, and therefore you know where the carbons are. And the other is, in three-dimensional space, those atoms truly are bonded at angles to each other. Um, alcohols are a class of organic compounds that have hydroxyl groups, or OH groups. And that are attached to an alkyl group. Uh, depicted above are propyl alcohol and isopropyl alcohol. Uh, their skeletal notations are also shown. A very general way of depicting any generic alcohol is to show a hydroxyl group on an alkyl or R group. And at the far right, I, that's what I have depicted. Carboxylic acids are uh, organic compounds found in nature. A uh, very interesting uh, group of compounds. They also have a hydroxyl group. You'll notice the, the OH um, uh, part of that molecule. But it's attached to a carbon double bonded to an oxygen or a carbonyl. That's the, the part that sticks up to the oxygen. C double bonded to O uh, in red on the far left. Um, this whole structure shown in red is called the carboxyl group. The more volatile members of this class, those with five or fewer carbons, are typically pretty vile smelling to humans. And honeybees apparently are not fond of them either. The first compound on the left is formic acid. Um, for, formica is uh, Latin for ant. And this acid was actually first uh, derived by distilling fire ants. And uh, this, this small carboxylic acid was uh, was isolated from them. Um, formic acid is commonly used to treat for varroa mite infestations. However, if it's, uh, it's used in the hive when the uh, ambient temperature is too high, 
uh, the vapors from this acid will cause the colony to flee the hive. I've actually had this happen before. Uh, I treated uh, a, a few hives last year with, uh, with formic acid. And uh, it was uh, probably about this time in the fall. The weather was fairly cool, but these hives were located up against a brick building that took a lot of morning sun, and they would heat up pretty good in, in the morning. And I think the, too much of the formic acid vaporized, and uh, you know, my bees were, were gone within a couple days, and then the, the hives were robbed out. So I had very clean frames, but uh, nothing to show for at the end of the season. The acid in the middle is acetic acid, and it's responsible for the sharp odor and sour taste of vinegar. The acid on the far right is butyric acid, so named as it was originally isolated from rancid butter, and it's responsible for the foul odor of other bad dairy products like sour milk. Um, yeah, when I talk about this in, in chemistry class, um, if you ever recall the the uh, the horrible smell after a young child's uh, thrown up their milk. Um, that's butyric acid, and uh, that's a, a smell most people are familiar with. This compound is used on fume boards to drive bees out of honey supers um, that are to be collected for extraction of the honey. So if the alkyl group or R group attached to the carb uh, carboxyl group is more than four carbons long, a carboxylic acid is also called a fatty acid. Uh, they're so named because the, uh, these compounds are derived from fats and oils. And these long alkyl groups, the big R groups, also confer the oily or waxy feel to these compounds and um, also limit their water solubility substantially. So you may know the old saying, water and oil don't mix. Um, this would be a good example of that. The carboxyl group itself uh, mixes very well with water, but if there are too many carbons attached to that growing chain off the carboxyl carbon, uh, that starts limiting the water solubility of these carboxylic acids. Now, as bad as carboxylic acids smell, um, derivatives made by chemically combining them with alcohols generally have pleasant, fruity, or flowery odors. These derivatives are called esters. The, uh, for example, when foul-smelling butyric acid and methyl or wood alcohol are condensed together, and I've shown that in equation one, the ester that results has an odor that resembles that of apples. Equation two shows the condensation of acetic acid uh, with isoamyl alcohol. And the ester formed here smells of, uh, of banana. And it's used as an artificial banana flavoring. Let's look at ketones for a moment. Ketones have that C double bond O carbonyl, uh, that carbonyl group. But that carbonyl carbon is flanked by uh, carbon atoms uh, or, or alkyl groups. So there's no hydroxyl group. That's how ketones are different from carboxylic acids. The structure on the right is uh, the simplest ketone, and it, it's, uh, it's acetone. It's a liquid, and it's actually the main component in nail polish remover. It's a, it's a good industrial solvent and works real well on nail polish. Um, just a, one more functional group or class of compounds that we should talk about. Uh, and, and this type, the terpenes, comes up in nature quite a bit. The odor of freshly crushed plant leaves or orange peel um, is from a volatile mixture of compounds called terpenes. Now, terpenes are usually made of 10, 15, or 20 carbons. So they're, they're, they're brought together in uh, or their basic building block um, when they're made in plants, is the five carbon isoprene molecule. And that's depicted on the left bottom of the screen. Um, the terpenes are further classified according to how many isoprene units are required to make it. So monoterpene, sesquiterpene, and diterpenes have 10, 15, and 20 carbon atoms, respectively. Um, 
The molecule on the right is a monoterpene called meth menthol. The two isoprene units in its structure are shown in red and blue, respectively. And then they're uh, connected to, together by bonds to carbon. That's uh, the two black bonds that close that ring up. And then there's a, an additional bond to a hydroxyl group. Uh, other terpene examples include the extracts from cloves, mint, roses, lavender, sandalwood, and, and pine. That's called turpentine. And these extracts are used as flavors, fragrances, and solvents. Um, between terpenes and esters, those two classes of chemical compounds are, are um, the basis of our flavors and fragrance industry here in the United States, which is a big part of the overall uh, chemical industry. Well, let's get back to, uh, to pheromones. And uh, we saw that uh, honeybee pheromones could be categorized earlier as either releaser or primer pheromones, depending upon whether they influence behavior or physiology. They may also be categorized by their function or gland of origin. So we're going to be looking at, at these nine basic uh, um, I, I would say chemical compounds, but some of these are actually mixtures of chemical compounds. But in these specific categories, we'll be looking at alarm, pheromones, brood recognition, uh, pheromones that uh, uh, drones produce, uh, pheromones from Dufour's gland, egg marking and footprint pheromones, forager pheromones, Nazanoff pheromone, and some queen-specific pheromone and pheromone mixtures. There are two main alarm pheromones. One is secreted from the Koshchevnikov uh, gland, which is located near the sting shaft. It actually contains over 40 distinct compounds, including acetate esters and long chain alcohols, big R groups with hydroxyl groups. Some of the esters, like isoamyl acetate pictured above, are low molecular weight, therefore volatile, and, and reach the human nose. If you ever smell a banana or pear-like scent when working with bees, it's the uh, isoamyl acetate in, the chemical, in this chemical mixture of, of the alarm pheromone. This mixture attracts other bees and makes them aggressive and more likely to sting. So when, um, when uh, the first bee stings and the stinger is pulled out and uh, this alarm pheromone is then released, um, it, uh, it's the call it's the call to alarm for the, the other workers in the area um, to, to come and help protect, and, and it will elicit the sting response from them as well. Another alarm pheromone is secreted from the mandible. It's a single compound, a, key, a ketone, called 2-heptanone. Older workers, like foragers, produce more of it. It was previously thought to be a marker for visited flowers. Um, but this may not be the case. A um, researcher named Papa Cristoforo and uh, other workers in his lab have shown that this ketone is an anesthetic used to paralyze wax moth larvae, varroa vero mites, and the like, so that they can be ejected from the hive. Brood recognition pheromone is a mixture of 10 different fatty acid esters emitted by larva and pupa. Um, if you look at the uh, molecule depicted at the bottom of the slide, um, that's an ester. I, I'm not showing the, the carbon that's part of the carbonyl in the very center because that's where the line segments end. And uh, so we understand that there's a carbon there. But you notice that there's two R groups in this molecule. And those R groups are often very long chains um, of carbon atoms. So thus, these are called uh, fatty acid esters when they have that. Um, this uh, mixture of 10 different fatty acid esters uh, allows nurse bees to distinguish between worker larvae, drone larvae, and pupa. It also arrests ovarian development and workers, so they'll not lay in a colony that uh, still has developing brood. All of this serves to keep the proper ratio of the various adult casts, nurse, foragers, etc., um, 
uh, keep that in balance. The exact composition of this e ester mixture actually varies with the age of the developing bees. So that's another wrinkle in, uh, in, in chemical communication with pheromones. Uh, the composition changes. So if, if you want to liken it to things that we hear, it's, um, it's like hearing the, uh, you know, with that chemical composition, uh, has a certain olfactory smell, if you will, to bees. But when you change that a little bit, it changes the tone of the tone of the communication. Much like we can say the same sentence two or three different ways and and convey different uh, messages by that. So even just subtle changes in this chemical composition can start to vary the message a little bit. Let's move on to drone pheromone. During a queen's mating flight, drones fly in swarm-like groups and collect at suitable places to mate with the queen. And it's been suggested that a drone pheromone is responsible for this behavior. Um, towards that end, ex extracts of drone heads appear to contain pheromones that are attractive to other drones, while extracts from other segments do not have this effect. Now, I looked around for you know, more information, and I'm getting the impression that maybe this is an area that uh, still warrants uh, uh, more research, and the exact chemical composition maybe isn't known. Uh, I imagine when they extract chemicals from, from the, the heads of drones, they probably get um, the suspected pheromone or pheromone mixture, but they get a lot of other things in there as well. And so teasing out which ones are responsible for chemical communication and which ones are for other reasons um, is not a simple task. And I'm sure that uh, you know, it's something that, that can be done. But um, uh, you know, when you have this complex mixture, uh, d just because it all came from the same place doesn't mean that it, it's all pheromone. Um, so that will probably have to be worked out and uh, then more information on the chemical composition would be forthcoming. DeForest gland fer uh, pheromone is the next uh, uh, pheromone mixture I want to consider. The DeForest gland opens into the dorsal vaginal wall where pheromones are secreted onto eggs as they're laid. This allows worker bees to tell if the eggs are queen or worker laid. The pheromone's a complex mixture of chemicals. And, and as many as 24 compounds have been identified. The queen's version of this pheromone is made up of long chain esters, like the longer compound with two oxygen atoms in it at the top, uh, the top of the two in the slide. As long as the hive is queen right, the worker version is a mixture of long chain alkanes with an odd number of carbons, uh, like the one at the bottom, so it's just a hydrocarbon. If the queen is absent, the workers also secrete esters onto the eggs they lay. Uh, some references list an egg marking pheromone as a distinct pheromone, although uh, from its description, it sounds like Dufour's gland pheromone. So uh, bottom line is it helps nurse bees distinguish between queen and worker laid eggs. An oily footprint pheromone is left wherever bees walk. In workers, this amplifies the effect of the Nazanov pheromone, which we'll consider in a few moments. The footprint pheromone is a particularly important pheromone with regard to the queen. When she deposits it, deposits it on the comb as she walks, she's sending a message that inhibits the workers from building queen cells, and thus this checks swarming. If the queen becomes immobile, she cannot spread the message, and the, pro uh, and the process to replace her may begin. Not surprisingly, the queen produces less of this pheromone as she ages, thus allowing the workers to begin planning for the, bee, uh, the queen bee's imminent demise and raising her successor. So again, it's like changing the volume uh, of the message as more or less of it is, is produced. Uh, foragers have, have uh, their own pheromone. Ethyl oleate 
is a trans fatty acid ester. Now the fatty acid part of the name comes from that long carbon chain and the trans part of the name has to do with the one carbon-carbon double bond that's in the, uh, on the far right of the molecule. And that, um, uh, in terms of three-dimensional space, puts a kink into that long chain. And so I was able to kink it down the side of my slide there, but that's the carbon-carbon double bond, and that's called a trans double bond. Or actually, I'm sorry, that's uh, what I have depicted as a cis is a cis double bond. That's what this I, I put trans in the um, I, I, I wrote trans in my notes. It's actually cis, which means it's uh, the two carbon groups are together. Um, this compound is a regulator that slows uh, uh, nurse bee maturation, and the purpose of this ester is to optimize the ratio of nurse bees to foragers. So, if the population of foragers is large then the nurse bees that would soon become foragers aren't immediately needed uh, as foragers, and, um, and they would benefit the colony by continuing their nurse bee duties. So uh, this, when there's lots of foragers, you have lots of forager pheromone, and that holds the nurse bees back. Okay, the Nazanoff pheromone pretty uh, um, commonly known one. It's one I, I hear people uh, talk about. Uh, the nazanone pheromone is secreted by workers and is used to mark nectar-laden flowers. However, the primary use is to help foragers return to the colony and to elicit swarming and nest-seeking behavior. One or more workers will release the pheromone at the hive entrance by raising their abdomen and fanning their wings to disperse the chemical mixture from their Nazanoff glands to the air surrounding the hive entrance. A picture of that. And if you've ever you know, sat at, uh, outside a hive entrance on a warm summer day watching the bees go in and out, uh, in addition to the occasional dancing bee that you might see out there, uh, you quite often see one um, or a, or a couple of bees out there uh, raising their tail and fanning like that, and they're spreading the Nazanoff pheromone. Now this mixture contains four related monoterpenoids. So that means there's 10 carbons, and, um, and then uh, to make them different compounds, there's varying uh, numbers of carbon-carbon double bonds and varying amounts of oxygen in them. Um, these four compounds are geraniol, citral, geranic acid, and neurolic acid. Each of these compounds originates from the connection of two isoprene units, but as I said, they vary in the amount of oxygen incorporated into the molecule and the types of bonds between some of the carbon atoms. Um, while most are single bonds, there are a few double bonds. A synthetic version of this pheromone is available commercially it's actually just a two-to-one mixture of, of citral and geraniol, and it's used as a swarm attractant. Finally, let's move on to some queen bee pheromones. Those can be broken down um, into uh, two classes. Um, uh, these are the queen mandibular pheromone and the queen retinue pheromone. Queen mandibular pheromone, or QMP for short, um, is a really complex mixture of chemical compounds used to control the complex behavior and social order of the hive. For this reason, it is said to be the most important set of pheromones in the hive. It controls all aspects of social behavior, like hive maintenance and swarming and mating behavior. It also inhibits ovary development in workers. Perhaps its single most important use is in retinue attraction, which we'll consider in a few moments. But first, let's get a sense of how complicated this pheromone mixture really is. So queen mandibular pheromone, or QMP, is a mixture of five compounds. Um, the first one, 9-ODA, that's short for E, 9-oxo-dec-2-enoic acid, and I think 
Most people are just happy to call it 9-ODA. Uh, this compound has multiple roles. It inhibits queen rearing behavior uh, and ovarian development in workers. It also influences drones as it's a sexual attract and exuded by the queen on her nuptial flight. Uh, if this compound is absent from the hive, then workers know the colony is queenless. The next compound, 9-HDA, uh, notice that I have written in front of it R and S. There's actually two forms of that compound. And if you look at the next to last carbon in the long chain of 9-HDA, you'll see that sticking up from that carbon, next to last carbon, is a hydrogen atom and a hydroxyl group, an OH group. And there's two ways that those can be put on. One is with the hydrogen in front and the hydroxyl in back as you're looking at it. And that's what the, the, the dashed bond means. That means that that hydroxyl group on the left one is, is pointing away while the hydrogen's pointing towards you as you're looking at it. Or they can be oppositely placed. There's, they've switched places. And in biological systems, that little change is significant. But in this case, we actually have both what we call both enantiomers of this compound. 9-HDA um, is responsible for calming and stabilizing swarms. And then two other mandibular pheromones are the uh, methyl hydroxybenzoate, HOB. Um, it's better known as methylparaben, that uh, third one. And 4-hydroxy-4-methoxy-phenylethanol, or HVA. Now, the queen retinue pheromone is actually a combination of the, of the chemical compounds found in the queen mandibular pheromone listed in the last slide and the four compounds listed above. Uh, methyl oleate is another um, um, fatty acid ester. It has a cis double bond in it. Uh, coniferal alcohol is an aromatic dialcohol or diol. Uh, the term aromatic comes from that six-membered ring uh, structure uh, that, uh, that uh, the two oxygens are, are appended to. Uh, in a lot of cases, those actually do have uh, um, pleasant odors or, or at least strong smells to them. Um, but aromatic also has to do with that, that structure now to chemists when we use that word. Cetyl alcohol is a 16 carbon uh, alcohol and alpha linolenic acid is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. That polyunsaturated term means that there's uh, a, uh, a couple of carbon carbon, in fact there's three carbon carbon double bonds in this molecule if you look in that long carbon chain and they're all cis double bonds and uh, um, you've probably You've probably heard the term polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, uh, if you are interested in the difference between you know, cooking oil and, and um, lard and fat. The queen retinue pheromone induces worker bees to surround the queen. In other words, form a retinue and tend to her needs. Now it stands to reason that a healthier queen will produce a lot of queen retinue pheromone and attract a larger retinue to care for her. And a group of entomologists from the University of Minnesota have teamed up with the Social Insect Research Group in South Africa to test this hypothesis. And I, um, I don't have the reference to this because I was just looking at the, uh, saw this story last night. But they're assessing hives by inspection for overall health and queen health by looking at brood laying patterns. And then they're also collecting 60 second videos of queens and their retinue and, and they are judging the retinue quality by counting the workers in the retinue and counting how many times workers touch the queen with their antenna and how many times workers feed the queen or groom her. And then uh, lastly, they're collecting samples of queen retinue pheromone from the queen's mandibles and analyzing it to assess the quality and quantity of the chemical mixture. Um, I was uh, really curious, how do you collect a pheromone from the queen's mandibles? And what they did is they took these tiny 
tiny silicone tubes, so small that they could hold them with uh, in a mechanical pencil. So I guess these tubes are about the diameter of a mechanical pencil lead. And they uh, hold the hold the queen in a in a trap uh, against a piece of cotton um, with her mandibles exposed. And then they put this tube in, into her mandibles and hold it there for five minutes. And they collect the chemical up into this tube and then they can later analyze that in, in the laboratory. What they're looking for are correlations between queen health, hive health, retinue activity, and the pheromone mixture's chemical composition and overall quantity. Um, they're just collecting data now from what I gleaned. But the study is described in more detail at, at a website. So if you want to write this down and, and uh, to take a, a look at that, it's called beinformed.org, B-E-E, -E, informed, with E-D at the end, dot org. And then just type queen retinue pheromone in the search box on their site, and it'll take you to a, a nice article about it. Well, that's really all I have today. Um, I have a list of references in the next slide if, if you're interested in, in delving into this in any more detail. Um, I guess with that, I uh, want to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to, to try to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you, Tom. And thanks for breaking the chemistry down into ways that are really understandable. I appreciate your um, very clear um, description of these chemicals and how they work in the hive. If you have questions for Tom, go ahead and uh, type those into the chat pod, and we'll go ahead and field those. So Tom mentioned the Be Informed article, and what I'll do is when I post the recording on our website, I'll also post the link to that article and, uh, as well as our handout from today's program. Tom, as folks are typing, do you have just a minute to talk about um, the kinds of research that you and Dr. Reed Johnson are working on? Sure. Um, you know, one thing, uh, everybody's concerned about um, pesticide use and its impact on bees, um, especially neonicotinoids. Uh, they've gotten a, a lot of press lately, and, um, you know, their use has skyrocketed in the last few years, and, and people are wondering if that's got something to do with, you know, what's going on with our bees today. Um, so we're, we're interested in looking at uh, combinations of chemicals and their effects on bees. I mean, uh, a lot of pesticides and other agrochemicals are, are tested, um, you know, in terms of what the lethal dose would be in, in honeybees and, and other insects. But uh, I don't know that combinations are looked at uh, that much. And so um, my research revolves around that. Actually, a project I'm working on right now uh, involves um, agrochemicals that are used in raising pumpkins. Um, there were some reports from commercial beekeepers in northeast Ohio last fall of, of heavy bee losses in hives that they hired out to uh, pumpkin growers. So we're, we're looking at the chemicals that are commonly used in, in raising pumpkins. And we're looking at the effects of uh, combinations of those chemicals on, on honeybees. And I'm really just getting started on it, so um, uh, don't really have anything to report yet. But uh, actually, Eastern Apiculture Society is supporting that work. And uh, I hope to present my findings um, oh, next July, I think. Uh, I'll be at the Eastern Apiculture meeting and uh, presenting there and let you know what I find. So actually, James T. has a question that deals with pesticides. He's wondering if we mess up with the communication in the hive when pesticides are applied um, or when there's drift. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, I haven't seen an actual article that, that says that. Um, um, and that's probably my, uh, you know, my naivety showing through. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a chemical researcher who took up beekeeping as a hobby, and I'm kind of switching over into, into to this bee research thing. Um, I can't imagine that, that it wouldn't have an effect. I, I bet there are scientific articles out there where people have looked at this. Um, 
you know, I, I kind of think about the chemicals, uh, the, the pheromones for bees are, are the communication like noises for us. And if you have a lot of different chemicals around, that's a, like a lot of different, that's, that's noise. And maybe you up the background noise when there's drift from, from sprays. Um, and so you're just disrupting uh, chemical communication sometimes. It's not necessarily um, you know, that the bees are getting poisoned or, or anything like that, but I, I imagine that there could be some effect. So Nancy asks about uh, using smoke after you've been stung, or um, maybe you can talk about smoke in general and its effect on that communication. Well, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of different things about it. Uh, obviously, that if you overwhelm, uh, if you overwhelm the, the bee's olfactory sense with other things, you'll short circuit, for example, the, the alarm uh, pheromone action. So they may be putting that out as you're tearing into their home and, and, and tearing, their, tearing their home and life apart, you know, when you're checking the hive. Um, but if you can, can mask that with the smoke, um, and I imagine it's probably just a crazy uh, message that they get from smoke. A lot of the things that, you know, you're, you're burning, uh, plant material, and all of those plant-based chemicals, many that, uh, very similar to the chemicals they use to communicate themselves are being put out there, um, and it, it must just short-circuit everything is the impression that I, I get. Karen asks about when bees are sick and how um, it's known to the rest of the hive that they are sick. You know, many times the um, bees will take out and get rid of those larvae or these, those poopy that are diseased. Does that have to do with some of the chemicals that are emitted or the, the pheromones? You know, it, it, it might be if, if there's a way for a bee to distinguish, you know, like a nurse bee and, and say mark um, you know, mark a cell um, that has a, a, a bad bee in it. But I wonder if it's more that if, if there's something going on that shouldn't be, there are going to be chemicals that will be produced that shouldn't be. Certainly, like if uh, a larva is not developing properly or even dies, as it starts to de decompose, there are chemicals common to decomposition that might be formed. And as soon as they sense those, they may realize that there's a problem and, and clean out that cell. So it, it might be along, along that idea or along those lines, yeah. Uh, Natalie says she's read that eating bananas before going to work with bees isn't a good idea. <laughs> well, yeah, it has that, uh, that uh, isoamyl acetate is, an, is part of the natural flavoring in bananas. And, uh, you know, if you've ever, if you've ever picked up a, a, a child or grandchild who's just eaten bananas and held them, uh, you know that they've got banana breath, and, and you do too. When you've had a banana and then go out and, and work on the hive, you're breathing out isoamyl acetate, and uh, that's sending a big alarm signal to the whole hive. 